meeting is being recorded. Okay, welcome everyone to uh, this week's uh, OMR architecture meeting. Um, today we have uh, two topics, uh, one a compiler topic and one um, broader to the, uh, the, the, the OMR uh, uh, project itself. Um, so the first uh, one today is uh, issue 4515, sorry, 4519 um, uh, from Debiendu. So uh, he's on the line and he's gonna take us through that. So please take it away, Debiendu. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yep. <coughs> Talk us through the yeah, issues. Sorry. Um, yeah, so, um, well, I'm just going to introduce the topic really because uh, I haven't done any, <laughs> any particular research on it. Yeah, no problem. Um, just wanted to. <clears throat> so, basically, um, as you know, I've got my own project which is uh, based on OMR. Uh, it is a cut down version of OMR. And so I've noticed that obviously I've got to <clears throat> replicate the list of opcodes <clears throat> that OMR has. Mm -hmm. And so maintaining that is a problem because obviously if the opcodes change, then I've got to update my list as well and make sure every time I sync changes, I have to compare the opcodes to make sure that uh, there's no discrepancy. So when I was looking at that, I obviously felt that uh, this is a problem and I <clears throat> was looking at a way of improving that and I noticed that um, basically the opcodes are defined in a header file, uh, but then they are also repeated. I mean, not exactly repeated, but the same sequence of codes are present in a, multiple places. And there's a common way of handling this in many projects. Uh, <clears throat> I think one of them was mentioned uh, in the issue as well. Mozilla, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Firefox, was it? I can't remember. But, <clears throat> but basically, um, instead of uh, defining the opcodes in, in a header file, in the header file, we, we can just define um, kind of a, uh, a macro invocation. So, you know, it can be anything, but some, all the various places where we need these opcodes and the associated parameters, we just put in a single header file. Um, <clears throat> but we don't define the macro there. We simply invoke the macro for each uh, opcode, passing all the various parameters we need. And then, uh, Everywhere we want to use these opcodes, we define the macro to expand what we need. So, you know, for example, if there were all total, let's say we need 10 fields, then each of these 10 fields would be passed in the macro invocation. But then if the if the location where you, like for example, if I need, just need the opcode, I don't need anything else, then I would define the macro where I'm, I need it, <clears throat> and I'd expand it to just the opcode. And so therefore, everywhere you just define the macro locally where you want to use it. Uh, and so the expansion is in your control in the location you want it, but you're guaranteed that it's the same list everywhere in the same order. So that was the proposal. I haven't really done any research to see. Uh, I had a quick look because in the opcodes header file, there is a, there's a list of places where opcodes are defined. So I had a quick look to see whether this was a viable approach. Um, <clears throat> so in my brief look, I think I thought it was viable. But, you know, I'm not familiar with the, and I haven't really dug deep into it. So you guys might know better that it's not viable or something. But uh, from what I saw, it seemed viable to me. And I feel also that there's no need to make immediate changes to upstream projects, like they can consume. Because when the upstream project uses uh, the header file, I guess the only header file they might use is the standard one, uh, the opcodes one. I'm not sure if they use other header files. <clears throat> so again, um, so you can have, I guess you could have, uh, because the expansion would apply to the upstream project as well, so they would see the expanded form. So from that point of view, they would not see any change, if you see what I mean. 
So yeah, it's uh, I've, t- I've tried to explain what I what I've been trying to uh, propose, but uh, hopefully it's clear. If it's not, then uh, please shout. Yep. Um, yeah. So thanks for, uh, for raising this issue. So um, we have done some experimentation within the compiler already um, with a similar uh, a similar technique as this. So if you look in the x86 um, uh, code generator, the way that the uh, instructions and their properties and, and other things are defined. It's, uh, it uses sort of a similar macro uh, approach as well. So um, it's so this I guess this this um, using this approach isn't that unprecedented for OMR. Um, there certainly are some benefits to it as as, as you pointed out and as, as we've already seen. But um, um, uh, I mean I guess the the question is whether or not this is a pattern that we think would be valuable to. Um, um, to, to start using throughout um, throughout the compiler and perhaps elsewhere. Um, the one little um, wrinkle in some of this as well is the way that um, we have to, um, so the way that some of these opcodes are being used in, in projects, it, the, the, the table that actually gets synthesized is actually uh, amalgamated from multiple um, uh, like a contribution from OMR and a contribution from a downstream project like like OpenJ9, for example, and then we put those two bits of information together into the same table. I think I think that's a very solvable problem even with this approach, but it's just something that we have to to, to bear in mind. Um, are there any opinions on this pattern as a as a as a way of representing some of the data, the tabular data that we have? Just looking around here. It's a pretty standard one. We use that technique for helpers, right? Yeah. The yeah. set bell macro is. I mean, we have to do something about this opcode table. You know, <clears> I'm <throat> getting heartily sick of it um, being linked across projects the way that it is. It's just a complete pain in the rear. I think this also gives us an opportunity to consolidate everything in one place. For example, mm-hmm. VP functions, which should get called for a particular opcode, can be put into this macro table. I don't think they should go there. I, I think that I. I Really don't think that the opcode, like the properties of the opcodes, yes, the handlers for any particular opcode need, may need to vary depending on um, the project, right? You you may want to change it. Um, in OpenJ9, for example, the handler for a particular opcode may be a different entry function that then delegates up to the parent. Uh, I think we need to try and keep the. If we go with this approach, I think the table needs to be pure in the sense that it is the opcodes. Now, I know maintaining the handler tables is a separate problem, but I don't particularly like coupling the IL representation to the optimizer implementation. I think that's a, a mistake, especially since the optimizer may need to vary differently. I agree with that. I think. I think we're given, like if the table was constructed with OpenJ9 handler, I assume that you could have different handlers with different compilation threads. Compilation no, threads. what I'm saying is, is that for at the OMR level, you may you can declare a handler table, right? And that handler table will have entries that correspond to the OMR opcodes. Now, whether we have extensible opcodes or not, I'm going to leave that aside. But when OpenJ9 consumes OMR, they may have additional semantics or additional things that they wish to do when they process a particular opcode. Call, for example, would be a good example. But wouldn't you just override the function? Accessible well, classes? It depends. And then do what, whatever you want underneath the hood. It depends which, it depends what model of extension you're going to use for that. Um, it's a bit unusual to couple the processor functions into the into the macros for like opcodes, right? It's like you it's like you'd be putting the evaluators or the encoders in x86 opcode table, which is not what the x86 opcode table does, right? There's a function that processes a table entry. And so if you have it separate entries, doesn't that defeat the purpose of consolidating things? Well, no, so there's, there's, there's two, separate, two separate problems, right? One is if you're consuming the opcode table itself, right, like and you're trying to keep that in sync, right? That's one problem, right? The other problem is the, the handler. They're two different problems. Well, it's any table that maps opcode to something, which there are many. 
I still feel very strongly that, that putting the handler <clears throat> function the macro is not the right yeah. thing to do. I don't think putting the handler yeah. function itself into the macro would be the solution. One you way may be one. able to synthesize the name of the handler you want. Right. So I could, I could I could buy something like yeah. we synthesize it by doing some token pasting of like the opcode right. name with the word evaluator and we regularize the That's function fine. names. It's even better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you could just have an extensible class with static functions on it or something, and then you could override it. Yeah. If you, or, yeah, or or a non-extensible class, and you do their virtual, yeah. and you override them using virtual in here. Just trying to avoid having to maintain five different tables across. Yeah. Right. The entire place. Right. But I don't think that we should bake function like if you want to derive the table from the macro That's using totally the macro fine, yeah. name, like the opcode name or whatever the hell you choose to do with it. That I'm fine with, but I don't want people putting function pointers or names of functions to be turned into function pointers into the actual opcode table. Right? Like it's also not very extensible because the more <coughs> optimizations that you write that need to process all the opcodes, the more you pollute the the opcode table. Yeah. You kind of want the IL to be able to stand on its own too, right? You don't want to make the IL dependent on some symbols that the optimizer is creating. Yeah, I, I think it's more like what you want it like, and the the, the review process that we would want for um, changes to those particular files or to that area of the code is almost certainly different than if you were proposing some changes to how the handlers are are structured, right? And being able to say if you're doing a commit that touches these files, a certain set of rules or procedures or review has to apply is, is easier to, to maintain. It's not coupled that way. How are the names supposed to work? You put a string in a table. Like it doesn't. So you can't build anything. Uh, but what you would do is you would you would do, so when you go to define the array of function pointers, you would write the start of the declaration of the array immediately. Then ahead of that, you would have the you would do the define of the the macro. You would include the header so that when uh, with that macro defined, it will expand, and what it would expand to is just the, the name of the opcode, and you can token paste that name with whatever suffix you wish to apply to it, and then you just generate a list of tokens, essentially, which become identified um, functions, right? And that's how LLVM does that kind of thing. Right? They use macro token pasting to join. Does LLVM use table gen? So parts of it, it's all being rewritten to use table gen. Parts of it were using that token yeah. pasting approach before. That's because their yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. their style's gotten a little bit more sophisticated in their yeah. their model. You know, this is the same problem with these. <coughs> so, so what you could do is you could define each one with a dummy implementation that does nothing, and then override the ones that you actually want to put any logic into. I see, okay. So if there's a new opcode that the table doesn't know about, it will do the effectively do nothing to this table. Because the IFAS would find the 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 right the, the project that's extending. When you're compiling it, you wouldn't even compile the file that's extending. Functions are um I guess it depends on how exactly you want to do it. If you want to do it with the extensible class method, what you would do is you would have a base class that has all of these methods on it with the default blank dummy implementations, and then you would inherit from that and override the ones you want. Whether that's stat done statically or with virtual methods, it's sort of an implementation. But you would only override the ones that you want special behavior for. <laughs> Can I ask? Can I ask an example of a handler? What what class? What file can I see this in? A handler, the, you know, list of handlers that's related to opcodes. VP handlers. Uh, so if you look at value propagation, there's a VP handlers file that contains the implementations, and there's a, a table. I forget which of the VP yes. headers it's in, but it's in the optimizer and directory. This is, uh, yeah. Oh, it's an optimizer, okay. Yeah, the, the, another example would be the simplifier. The simplifier <coughs> and the optimizer. So there's a number of 
things in the optimizer where you want to define behavior per op code. So you're going to have a handler for each particular op code that's going to do something. And you're going to uh, implement one of those functions per op code to do whatever it's supposed to do for that op code. And you could almost even see the same pattern happening in the tree evaluators and the code generators where there's an evaluator per op code node. I think that needs to get done. I think that's a good change. Is if you want to find the evaluator right now, you have to go to the table and then look it up what it is on each code gen. We should standardize the name. And this would do it. Yeah, so I'm just trying to have a look, but um, so there is, <clears throat> I guess there is a implementation for each opcode. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Well, personally, I, I, I agree. There's implementation for most opcodes. There's usually some kind of default, uh, which is bit like, so for the simplifier, for example, some of the opcodes. <clears throat> There isn't anything that we want to do other than to simplify the children of that node. So there's actually a, a default simplifier function which simplifies, just says simplify my children and then return. And that default gets put into a number of entries in the table. <clears throat> sure. And I, I agree with what you were saying before is that the macro list isn't going to solve this problem. It's not meant to be kind of a mapping from, say, opcode to handler. So I think that needs to be done by each each uh, place where you want to use. The, so yeah, so I agree with, with what you were saying before. So I, I think it's a means of standardizing how we generate that list of functions. Um, now I think the one danger, the one thing we have to be a bit careful of is if you just generate an entry for every single opcode, there may be a non-trivial amount of ELL code growth from all of the dummy functions, right? So if you look at the simplifier, uh, for example, there's a number of places where we just use default simplifier, which just says simplify the children and carry on, right? There's nothing special to do for this guy, right? And all of those currently are all represented by one function, not one function for each that just simplifies the children, right? right. So we may have to think a little bit more about how maybe doing something a little more sophisticated right. uh, with the macro to avoid having to expand the number of functions to one per opcode. Yes, yeah. sure. yeah, yeah. so the way I was seeing it is that I was seeing it more as something where you don't have any impact on the current consumers of these opcodes, which means that they see exactly what they see now. So it's right. just the uh, controlling. So at the moment, you have, I think, six or seven places right, where, where there's a list of these opcode related things, right? And they all have to be in the same order, I guess. And they all have to match the opcode list. So what I was proposing is made just to solve that problem without impacting any consumers of those, op those lists. So, you know, if you try to do more than that, then it's going to become more and more complicated. Yeah, so I think the thing is, is to, the, so there's there's a several dimensions to the pain points uh, related to opcode, to the opcode table. One is OMR chooses to add a new opcode and it adds that opcode to its table and all of the associated optimization tables and so on and so forth. And downstream consumers who have their own tables or their own things that map to those that need to be in that same order get broken because the order is not the same or the length is not the same and you have to make a change to avoid being broken, uh, which is one serious problem. The other problem though is that if you go and add an op code in OMR, at the moment you need to know where all of the OMR tables are that are derived from, that have to match that opcode list. So like you were asking before, and I just said PP and simplifier right off the top of my head, I know, I know you need to go and modify those. Um, it adds an extra burden to adding an opcode, right? Um, it's not obvious that you should go and modify those things. If there was a way that we could make it so that 
by doing the, op, oh, the uh, macro transformation to help the downstream projects, if we were able to derive the tables um, for the optimizations within OMR, you no longer have to be an expert on all of the optimizations to know what to do for them, especially if we found a way to sort of put the default in, right, like basically say, unless I put your opcode name in some list or define it into some list, that says these are ones that have custom handlers. If it's not in there, use default whatever, and that will just map to the default, which just does whatever the simple thing is, right? Like simplify the children or constrain the children and, and, and carry on. Right? Um, ideally, whatever solution we pick, I think, would address both of those problems. Um, sure. So, so to take a specific example, I've just been looking at this file called OMR Simplifier Table Enum.hpp, right? And in that table, you've got uh, a list of values against each of the opcodes, like uh, DFT Simplifier maps to bad IL op, and then DFT Simplifier to A const, and const Simplifier to I const, and so on, yeah? So in my proposal, this DFT simplifier would be present as one of the fields in the main header file. And so <clears throat> that would be a parameter to one of the, uh, to the macro, one of the parameters. That or it I could think. be a derived one. Well, it can't be a derived one because this is like a mapping, right? So it would yeah, be so present there and it would be expanded was, here. Yeah, so what I was objecting to was putting that as a thing into the opcode table. Uh, the opcodes should not be coupled to the optimization handlers. The better way to do it is to derive the names of the handlers from the opcode, and you can then do that using macros and token pasting so that you don't have to embed the handlers into the uh, opcode macro. I think the only way that works is if you can include the default value. But in this case, you know, it's not going to work, right? Because, um, for example, if you're talking about the same table that I'm looking at, then the multiple opcodes map to the same value. And you can't just derive that from any using any logic, can you? So, so in a simple so, expansion, we'll not be able to expand it to the right value. So if the handlers are renamed to a regular format where they name the opcode <laughs> followed by whatever suffix, it is derivable. Um, the only question then is how do you handle the ones that just need to map to a default, which is the thing I haven't sat down and thought about, but yeah. there may be a way to solve yeah. that. I, I think that problem probably requires some more in-depth and further discussion, but I think it should be doable. You yeah. can do it with templates. <laughs> just you you want to template everything, Leo. <laughs> <That's> just... <laughs> In fact, if I gave you a template, you'd template it. So, um... <laughs> Mark mentioned earlier that the opcode table should stand on its own. And my question is why do we want that? Why do we really care? It's just an array. I mean, logically, yes, it should stand on its own. And so from the a logical kind of, perspective, but what is the actual downside? The, the kinds of concerns that I would have if we start putting function pointers into the opcode table itself is what happens if a, der a derived project wants to add its own optimization that also has this behavior. They can't modify OMR's opcode table to add a new field for every single opcode. That's add not a new field. As in they entry in the yeah. macro, right? So yeah. if you if you go and say the hand the, the VP handler for this particular opcode is named whatever, right? And the simplifier handler for this thing is named whatever. If in a derived project I want to create what Ben was saying of a per opcode handler in an optimization that does not exist in OMR, adding that is practically impossible in that model, right? You'd basically have to pick a naming scheme that matches one of the OMR optimizations and, and use that, right? And it's, yeah. it's bad form. It would be much better to be able to just standardize the naming so you can derive the name of the handler um, and have a mechanism where we could just default 
right? So that if you don't specifically say that you're going to handle one, right, through the macroing mechanism, that you're just going to get the default. Um, that's going to require a little bit more thought on how to make that expansion work. But I think it macro the macros are essentially Turing complete almost anyway, so we they're should not. Be able to, they're not quite. <laughs> <laughs> the templates are. The uh, template things are. And, and goal of this uh, or whatever project should be that you should be able to add and remove an opcode from the opcode table without affecting any other portion of Omar or any downstream project. Well, okay, so how would you feel about a solution where, let's say, we just do a kind of a straight token paste and say for a VP handler, um, if you add an opcode, it derives the name of that handler. Um, and kind of an intermediate state would be where um, all of a sudden it becomes a symbol that you're using without having ever defined it. Um, so it would be a compilation error and it's very clear which thing is missing and you wouldn't necessarily have to implement it in a list and make sure that it's in the same order, but you would still have to implement it manually. Right, so this right. is kind of an... I think we should explore the solution of trying to do the default thing by default without having to define all these things. Um, if we can't get there, then yeah, sure. Compilation failure is not the end of the world. So right. Implement the sub-function and call yep. it. Okay. Right, and my, my only concern with the sub-function was the, the, the footprint growth of the JIT DLL yeah, right. from yeah. all of those extra sub-functions yeah. that are essentially doing the same thing. I think we need some exploration in the area. Yeah. Prototype yeah. something and then see where we go. Yep, fair enough. I'm not sure that the I, I know I agree with the two goals that, that you set out there. I'm not so sure if they both have to have have to happen at the same time. Right. Like the first one I think Yeah, because we could switch to using the macro based opcode table without fixing all of the handler tables just for now. <clears throat> and it it yeah. would fix that we have to have the enum and the properties in the same order. Well but, we, we could look into the solution further down the line. Yeah, it's the, it's the, it's the uh, not breaking downstream projects one that I think is a little bit harder to solve. Um, so that I think needs a bit of thought for how we're gonna pull all that information together and not cause breakages. I'm not, it's not clear in my mind how that's gonna work um, or even how this solution is gonna solve that. I think we just need to, you know, warm body to play around with it. <laughs> Yeah. When I can move adding off code wouldn't break it because the thing of having a default handler. Yeah. Removing I'm not sure if there's Yeah, I don't think there's any possible solution to remove. Adding you mean output. adding at the end or adding in no, the middle? If you added it in the, in the well, I guess I don't know. Because people add things alphabetically right now, right? Yeah. But or it's ish. 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 I, I think the order is family. That, family I, I think right, but I, but family, I, I, yeah. I think the order of the actual entries in the enum, if they're being derived from the, the macro version, is less material, right? I, I don't think that there's not, it's bad form to be trying to test ranges on enums and similar such yeah. things, right? It's, it's very fragile. Um, it would the thing anything that is based on like an enum range check at the moment should be converted into a proper property that can be tested on the the opcode itself, right? And you might have to grow some extra bits to do it, but that would be far safer and more extensible if we're really truly worried about the extensibility and the ability to extend this stuff. Relying on code on adjacency in the enum seems like the most fragile thing you could possibly do. Mm -hmm. Um, so, to begin you, I think that the, uh, the the general consensus here is that it's a it, it's a good design pattern for us to uh, um, for us to adopt more broadly within within the code base. Um, I think that there are some areas that we do need to explore um, here. Um, I'm wondering, um, is this something that you're willing to uh, um, experiment with and perhaps propose a, like in a in a pull request some some ideas or? Yeah, sure, I can do that. Um, my only problem, which I think I need to make you aware, is lack of time. So sure, <laughs> it I, uh, might take a while. Yep, completely might take understood. a while for me to do anything. Okay. Um, in the meantime, but maybe other we'll than begin... that, yes, very yeah, happy okay. to. Okay. Maybe what we can do as well is to continue some of the discussions or some of the ideas that we've had around um, what would be 
part of the macro, what we would define within the macro um, in mm -hmm. this issue that you've, that you've created just so that we have some, some permanent discussion there um, that, that's documented that could help you um, as you think about designing something. So. You may want to. Sure. Um, I think the, the main issue seems to be this mapping between uh, the op codes to handlers, right? Because I was looking at this right now, and I guess where you have multiple op codes mapping to one single handler, uh, how do you do that? One-to-one um, okay. -one mapping is easy enough because you can just follow a pattern, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, or you could implement it by saying it's always one-to-one -one mapping, and any and and individually those mappings have to forward those handlers have to forward to a common handler if they wish to use a common handler. You could so do it that way. The, the concern that I expressed <coughs> about that, which does need to be addressed, it's is called bloat, right? Oh, oh, you, well, is is the the size of the binary produced by the compiler? Because the OpenJ9 project and other projects do care about how big yeah. the project is when it's built. Um, it's fairly weighty yeah, as it yeah. is, and uh, again, making yeah. it a little bit more overweight is not going to uh, endear us to anybody. Okay. Yeah, and the other other approach, which uh, <laughs> I was originally, yeah, so I was originally thinking of is to just include the name of the handler, obviously, without realizing that it's a handler. Uh, I just saw it as a list. I didn't realize that it was a handler, which is the name of a function or whatever. No, but obviously, I originally function. thought it would be a parameter to the macro. Now, that potentially, as I think what you guys are saying, is that could cause a problem for, say, OpenJ9, right? Yep. yep. It isn't the preferred design. Not the preferred design. Uh, so. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, we completely understand about the the the, the time uh, commitment. We all have um, similar um, um, constraints as well. Um, but uh, um, any progress that that you can make on here, I'm I'm sure will be um, uh, we're happy to review and, and and move things forward with that. We this is really something that we like to see. So that's uh, uh, so thanks for proposing it. Um, is there any more discussion you want to have in person on this topic before we move on? This last point I was going oh, to make sorry. is that we should probably do some archaeology to see if we can find the issues items that um, that Ali would have opened when he was going through this the last time and creating the opcode table that's there now, because he may have evaluated some other options as a part of that process, and we should at least recover and understand what thought process he went through if we can. Okay. That might have bearing anyway. That's something we'd have to do because it would create yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good point, Mark. Thanks. All right. Okay. Well, um, if there's no dis more discussion on that, um, let's move on to our next topic: um, using Clang to format the OMR source, uh, number 4577. So I think Philip's going to take us through um, that issue. Okay. Uh, is Robert on the call? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Um, okay, so um, <laughs> we're back here a year later. Um, we had a, a short initiative last year um, to try to introduce some clang formatting into the code base. Um, it never really made it to production for one reason or another. Um, and here we're trying to resurrect that um, that, that, that project. Um, so in 4577, uh, Listed um, some background information and a couple of discussion points, which we can talk about uh, during here. I don't expect us to finish all of this or even make any decisions here. Uh, I'm just going to take notes on kind of stuff we discussed, um, and we can have a community um, retrospect after the fact. Um, so uh, the whole idea here is to introduce some automation to uh, format our source code into um, consistent and um, documented style, um, which will be tool checked, um, debatable, um, something we'll have to discuss. Um, and some of the <clears throat> some of the benefits of uh, automatically formatted code, I've listed a couple of projects uh, down at the bottom, uh, case studies, um, most notably um, Mozilla is going through this right now. Um, Go format, um, the Go language itself has a built-in formatter which everyone follows um, to format pretty much every every um, code base you see in, in, in GitHub. 
Uh, MongoDB, Chromium, and LLVM all use automated code formatting uh, via Clang. Um, so I've listed some interesting um, blog posts, et cetera, that are found online. Um, the MongoDB one was quite interesting um, because they note some of the pain points uh, which developers um, had in their transition, but um, it was overall positive once, once it was complete. So um, I guess in, in summary, uh, I wrote a couple things on, on why I think we should um, format our, our code into a consistent style. Um, it's easier to, to write. Um, again, you don't have to worry about code formatting. Um, install a tool in your favorite editor and just format your code as soon as you're done writing it. Um, it's easier to read. Um, the code base is consistent from depending on what uh, component you're working on, whether it's GC or the VM or the compiler or each individual code gen within the compiler. Um, if things are consistent, um, you know exactly what to expect and you won't be caught off by uh, code formatting and consistencies between the components you're looking at. Um, it's also easier to maintain. Um, I noticed many times when we make our changes, uh, we have our editors configured to eliminate white space or introduce tab spaces, yada, yada. Um, we all, some of us format uh, code fi files at, at the same time, so you'll introduce a whole bunch of unneeded white space changes all around your, your, your code, um, which is just noise in the PR, um, which focus more on the semantics of the PR rather than the stylistic um, aspects of it. And finally, I think most importantly, it's uncontroversial. Um, if we settle on a particular style, um, we never have to argue about code stylus in, in PRs. Um, we can just avoid that. The tool will do it for us, and we can focus on the semantics of the contribution rather than, than the style. Um, so there's some of the um, points, I guess, the pros towards it. Of course, this is going to be a pain. It's a controversial subject, a subject subject for, for some developers. Um, so we need really a community consensus before we uh, head down this path. So um, the first question of discussion is, is it worth it? Um, I think it, it is, um, but I'd love to hear any community uh, feedback. Uh, I kind of disagree with you. I think it's a no-brainer, really. You should just do it. <laughs> I don't understand why we even are discussing this. <laughs> it's a, such a no-brainer, really. Why would you not do it? Crazy not to do it. We tried in the past, and there was lots of people who were very opinionated about what style to go to. That was sort of the... Well, I think you should just say, you know, this is the style, this is it. Somebody should just be the dictator and say, this is it. Perfect. End of story. I as long as it's consistent, it's done by a tool, who cares? Well, I tend to so agree. My... I'm not going to get into the what the hell format should we pick, but one of the concerns that I've had with some of the proposals that have occurred in the past for the style is that parts of the optimizer can be highly nested in terms of the levels of conditionals that you're dealing with. The conditions in some of the if statements are highly complex, and at the moment, the formatting of those things has been done with some care by the people who went and put them in to try and aid the comprehension of what's going on. Now, I'm not saying that that cannot be preserved by a tool, but things like hard column limits, rigidly enforced sort of ways of some of the things being indented and formatted can significantly hamper reading some of the more complex parts of this compiler because of the nature of that code. Now, I'm not saying that we can't overcome that with an appropriate style, and I'm certainly willing to consider it, but just saying this is the style, and just, just saying that this I is the style and forcibly applying it without looking at what happens in these parts of the code is negligent because it will significantly hamper the ability to find and fix problems in this code and to understand what it's doing. The format will be consistent, but it will be unreadably consistent. Um, Andrew, is that an argument to approach something like this incrementally? I don't know if that it is an argument for incrementalness. It's an argument for some careful consideration of the style choices that are made and looking at how they affect the most complex parts of the code. Both the interpreter and in the JIT. If we're going to 
reconcile both of them, we need to make sure that your ugliest, thorniest, nastiest, most nested parts of the code with the biggest condition format as well, and that the stuff deep inside the JIT formats well. Because I, I really worry that we're going to have a much harder time reading some of those conditions if the for, auto format tool does uh, ugly things with line breaks and things like that. Spend it forever in the browse in your code editor trying to bracket match and things like that rather than seeing it laid out neatly for you. I mean, if that happens, we should when you read when you get to that code that's unreadable, we refactor it. We refactor it at that point, right? Like we that's an argument for yeah. rewriting that code. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's too complex. So on, on, on it's that an point, argument for I more think work for the people that are maintaining it. Well, we should do that. I mean, it's. My, my my opinion here is that every time somebody goes down this road, you spend a ton of time reading about how we should do it in the style. Somebody in the past has tried to match it up to current test road for style, and somebody has done this and that. It's such a waste of time. And I, you know, I agree that there are places where we have conditionals that are tough to read that need careful formatting to make them readable. We shouldn't preserve just rewrite that code to, to get rid of that. Because it's, the argument is we want to maintain the white space to, to, to maintain this ugly piece of code. Well, let's maybe go a little bit higher and rewrite that ugly piece of code. So it's not you're so significantly increasing the risk of what you're proposing doing with the code base at that point. I mean, we can't be risk averse. Yeah. How, how long are we going to be risk averse? Are you the one that's going to have to debug all the problems that come out of it? Sure. I'm perfectly willing to. I mean, like we, we seem to never be able to make a, make any forward progress on something as simple as code, code formatting because we can't make some tough decisions. I agree it's not, you know, there are issues, but it really doesn't have to be. So one of the approaches we've that. taken to this with the with the J9 code base before it was open sourced was we wrote up a coding standard on what the rules should look like and applied it incrementally as we modified code. So anything that was modified got adapted to what our new rules were. Anything that was uh, pre-existing was left. And, and this significantly decreased the risk because you were only reformatting and modifying the pieces that were actively being worked on anyways. Dan, was that file by file? Uh, no, it was probably method by method. Okay. I would say that's part of the purpose the tool, of right? the consistency point. Um, we're in no better place than we are today. If, if we do it that way, then we can't have a tool do it for us. Right. We can't have a tool to check. And there's parts that are never going to get touched yeah. Yeah. for years. And we'll actually be in a worse state while we're in flux because we'll have both the old and the new in places, that's correct. plus the new in places where we're not happy with it. So that's, I'm not sure that sounds like a less risky. It also, it's also harder for something like Git blame um, because you can't ignore. Yeah. If you format everything at once, you can just ignore a single commit when you do a Git blame. Um, if you do it incrementally, it's, it's a real pain. Get yeah. spread out. Yeah. Well, but on, on the other hand, if you're only incrementally changing the thing that you're changing, then Maybe get blame just works properly. <laughs> yeah. but Except you would have a ton of changes in an unrelated area to your change if you're doing a function by function, for example. I'm actually thinking of doing it diff by diff, which is, in my opinion, even worse. <laughs> so I think I think you know um, I think if you care about the formatting which has been done specifically in certain places, then just tell Clang because you can tell Clang not to format certain bits. So just tell, just put some Clang instructions to say don't format this file, and that's it. And I suspect that there'll be a handful of such files, probably only a few. The rest you probably don't care about, right? So it's another discussion point. Um, I guess there is, yeah, as you mentioned, there is a way to turn off Clang, um, but how lenient we should be with that is up to debate. Um, if we start sprinkling Clang format on off. All over the code base, then we're kind of defeating the purpose of. No, I'm I'm saying only where somebody says I really have formatted this in a specific way, and I care so much about it, I can't lose it. Uh, like, 
what, what was being said a short while ago. Only so, only when somebody explicitly says that they want this to be uh, absolutely formatted in this way and no other way, you could start by saying, okay, let's just section this code off. Uh, say to Clang, don't touch this code, and that's it. The rest of the code base just gets reformatted. <clears throat> Personally, I think it's a no-brainer, really. Nobody should be manually formatting code. It's It's like... I don't know. I mean, it's just crazy. It sounds crazy to me. And if the code requires manual formatting, it just tells me that that code needs to be rewritten, as somebody was saying. Okay. Uh, How widely do the <clears throat> tools for this kind of formatting run? Like, does Clang format run on all of the platforms that we currently have developers on? Um, it runs on Linux, Mac, and Windows, if that's what you're asking. Um, runs everywhere. X. Um, does anybody develop on AX? Does anybody actually commit on AX? Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. That I'm not sure of. Um, you guys sit closer to the, the main AX developers than I, I do. I don't think so. No. Well, uh, <laughs> if they are, they could just run it by, through a Linux box. Yeah. Yeah, they it's, probably have a laptop. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they run the AX on a laptop. <laughs> Can I make a suggestion, maybe? Sure. Um, <laughs> maybe controversial. Still, but can we just do this and then <laughs> and then for people who run across a piece of code where the formatting has dramatically made it harder to work with, we consider on a case by case basis putting the clang unformat whatever the the term is around that piece of code that's affecting somebody who needs to change that piece of code. And I know that's not. Uh, an ideal solution from the perspective of someone trying to debug stuff in, in code, but I think it moves us forward and it gives us an out if there's something that somebody really needs to change in order to make it more maintainable. And the options at that point are refactor that code to make it more legible, and if that's not tenable, then, then undo the formatting around it or lock in the formatting around it and put it back to the way it was. And that becomes a case-by-case -case basis that committers can make a choice about, just like they can make a choice about any other thing that's there. Um, that's my line in the sand. So I, I'm not. I'm also not interested in talking about any of the details of how to format the code and whether it's tabs or spaces or whatever, or Clang or Mozilla or whatever format. I don't care. Yeah. You guys can figure that out. I'm sure. <laughs> I have great confidence in everybody's ability to figure that out, and I have. Pretty good confidence in my ability to be able to read whatever code is there in front of me. So, not that I have to do it as much as you guys do. Um, but I, I think I'm agreeing, I guess, with uh, the frustration over the amount of time that we've spent discussing this and considering it. And um, in my opinion, the benefits outweigh the costs as long as we're cognizant that there may be places where we need to undo this uh, in order to make it practical to work with the code base. Mark, are you suggesting a one-time format, or are you suggesting an ongoing yeah. format of every PR? I'm suggesting a one-time pull the rip toward change everything in Omar. I'm not saying anything about it. In red literature studies from other projects doing this, one one time do it is the way to go. Right. Is the consensus. Yeah. It will be way more painful if we do this incrementally if we're going to use an automatic tool. I think. Yeah. My question is, maybe you know the answer. Um, try to put a pull request, and that pull request is accepted, and some tool formats it. It's not the same as what I have in my repo, so I wouldn't. Like, what happens if I re pull? So, as I understand it, what we would want is some sort of check that would try to run the formatter, and it would either warn you or prevent you from merging it at all if there were any changes. This is Tell where you. the automation discussion comes in. Um, do we want to have automation built around this, uh, which is already available in tons of other open source projects? Uh, for example, GitHub Hook, um, which will guard checking in code which is does not fit the formatting style. Um, it'll just be a like a copyright check failure type of job, um, and committers will not merge or change unless it's properly formatted. Um, in my opinion, having automation with the formatting is a necessity. Otherwise, if we don't have automated checking, we're just not going to follow any format and we'll get back to the state we are in today. Very 
quickly. I, I like the idea of a um, of a pull request check um, for the formatting, just like in, in, you just said. Um, I also think that um, the before you deliver your code, I think actually running something locally to actually do the formatting so you can see it yourself. If, if something very bizarre is happening, I mean, sure, I would think that for the most part, your code is going to match with the formatting more or less of spaces or whatever, but, or maybe the brace is on a different line, but if something completely bizarre happens to your code, I kind of like to see that um, before delivering it just to make sure that. Yeah, so this is kind of a developer. It does well, raise well, the, the bar to entry though. One more activity that anybody who wants to deliver a PR would have to do. It makes it that much harder to contribute because now not only do you have to get OMR set up and build in, you have to get. I don't think it's that big of a barrier. Like lots of open source projects do this. Yeah. Um, like there's an expectation in general if you contribute to a project, you're going to follow their guidelines. And whether if you don't follow them, whether that results in like a tool telling you you did something wrong or a committer telling you you did something wrong in a comment. Like, either way, I don't think it really changes that much. In fact, I would say that it almost reduces the barrier to entry because they, a lot of developers have already used tools like this. So it does is it forces you to have those tools set up and enabled. Um, and so people, I think we forget sometimes how much work is involved in getting an environment set up to build these projects. It's not straightforward for your average person. I think Docker largely solves that problem. Um, but I mean, client format is not some exotic tool. Um, yeah, it's plugins a, for pretty much every editor anyone yeah. uses out there. Yeah, it's a very common tool. I think the vast majority of people who would want to contribute to OMR would either know how to set up the tool in their environment or already have it set up. With this, you're selecting for that group of people, so. Yeah, and I think it's large. If we look at the number of people that contribute to OMR, it's, it's no different than LLVM, for example. Yeah. Even if you ignore that, Already, if we don't have an automated tool for doing it, a committer is going to tell them to do it anyway, and then they're going to have to go back and do it. To be do, could we maybe get a non IBM perspective uh, on this? I mean, I think most people on the call are IBMers. Uh, yeah. well, no, no, no. I mean, no, no. But what I was specifically asking about is uh, running the extra tool before checking it. Uh, well, there, as I was extra, saying yeah. to me. As I was saying to me, it's a no-brainer, no really. I mean, I always have Clang format. I mean, all modern tools like Visual Studio or C Lion, or I use C Lion or Visual Studio or VS Code. They all support Clang format out of the box. And the moment yeah. they see a Clang format file, they will format your code by using the Clang format. So I don't see, I mean, to me, it's a no-brainer, really. I don't see why it's a problem. If, if people are using VI, maybe, I don't know. It's such a pain to tell you the truth. I, I've only tried to change, submit a few changes, small changes uh, as pull requests, and it's been a nightmare trying to get the formatting. Firstly, I don't even understand what the formatting is. And secondly, <laughs> trying to match match it is such a nightmare because your IDE keeps messing it up because it doesn't know about your formatting, how you want it. <clears throat> so it's a nightmare. I'm telling you, whereas the solution is so simple, just have Clang format there, it does it for you. And you can have uh, something, if you're really concerned, you can have commit hooks or whatever so that every time somebody pushes a change, it automatically reformats it. I think some projects do that. I've not done that personally, but I always use Clang format for all code I'm writing. I, I'm using, and all the IDs I'm using, they always have inbuilt support for it. So I, I've looked into other projects which do formatting um, as a post commit. Uh, so what they would do is they would take your entire PR change and format the merge commit and then create another commit from that. Um, the issue with that is I've found um, is that people complain that um, 
it introduces your local repo no longer matches. Yeah, your local repo repos. doesn't match what ends up being pushed out there. So um, when people start merging changes in, it, it becomes really weird. Um, and the things you are reviewing do not necessarily match the things that end up being committed. Um, so now, what about if we had the automated test and we used it as a kind of warning to say that if you accept this PR as is, it's going to get reformatted? Or would you <laughs> run the find format tool and check if the output is the same? If it's not, I believe find on format yeah. has a mode to <laughs> run. It's difficult to do as a pull request test. Yeah, but I, I think like find format even supports like a mode where if the format doesn't match, it will basically commit a sort of compiler, fine, even compiler easier, error. Even easier, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't buy the over um, making it harder for people to contribute to OMR either. I mean, the, the alternative to using claim format, which isn't that hard to get, is read and process and diagnose. Uh, it gets a 1500 line markdown file that describes our coding standard right now. It's kind of absurd in a way. Which I mean, not followed. They're all relatively well justified and all that. So it's not just like there's lots of stuff in there that's not strictly speaking documenting the coding format. But given the. the How the much of this is a JIT specific problem. Um, the whole code base is one style if we're doing this. Yeah. Yes. We have, yeah, we, we have multiple styles, but when I'm listening to the complaints about editor problems and trying to understand what the formatting is, given it's inconsistent with everyone else. It applies to both that, code bases. It applies to both that, code bases. Sorry, can I finish, Andrew? I haven't gotten that feedback about uh, the, the non-JIT code. Um, yes, there's a variety of, of inconsistencies in the rest of that code as well. People seem to adapt to it more easily. Is this a overall project problem or is this you know, based off of the particular formatting that JIT has been using? I think that um, it, it doesn't matter which style we choose. I think just having a style which is documented and automated is the point. And also consistent. And yeah. well, having a format implies consistency. Um, like, I mean, I've gotten to a point now where I don't care what style we use. I'm just tired of the fact that in my IDE, I have spaces for the compiler and tabs in the VM, and it's just frustrating to deal with all that. I don't care what we use anymore now. It's just, I just want one style. Yeah. In terms of uh, the, the parts of OMR that have had the most external contributions to it, I think that the compiler and JIT builder have had the, the most um, external, when, when, I mean, when I say external, I mean outside of IBM contributions. So um, those are the ones that tend to give the most feedback about style and, 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 and editing and that, and that sort of thing. So if you haven't heard much about the non-compiler or JIT builder components, it might just be because there haven't been a lot of um, those that aren't experienced with that code contributing to it. It's a fair comment. I think if anyone has concerns about um, code formatting an entire large code base, I'm talking a million lines plus, um, have a look at some of the case studies and read some of the blog posts from the other engineering teams who have been through this and some of the feedback that was received after the fact. Um, I think it's enlightening uh, at the very least uh, to get some perspective from another project um, rather than basing assumptions off of what we think would happen. Certainly making a change that's overtly about making it consistent and easier to use your code base seems like a user focused kind of activity, whereas arguing over whether we should use this coding format or this other coding format that we're currently using seems more like an inwardly focused Yeah, and some of the war. points that have come up during this discussion are noted in some of the blog posts. Um, so. Yeah, I think we should learn from, from other projects. Um, have been done in the past. Um, it does require a little bit of dictatorship and pushing at the end of the day. Um, Question on that point, when, what timeline are you thinking? So this feels like uh, an OMR release, <laughs> 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 um, which was, yeah, another one of the points of the discussion. So the other thing that's happening, um, the number of pull requests is actually growing. The backlog of PRs is actually growing. So we're like at 109 as of, as of today. 
um, I think a change like this is going to cause merge conflicts. Yes. Um, every one of them. Every one of them. So, yes. Um, unless so MongoDB suddenly... actually has a blog post on handling that specifically. Um, so they have a quick way of solving that by creating an extra commit, um, which people can merge onto cleanly. Um, okay. So it's a problem they they started down on. They realized that it was going to be an issue, um, and they found a way to fix it. And they have a detailed step-by-step -step instructions on for other projects on how to do this. Um, because everyone's code that's in flight right now yep. will be having merge conflict yep. after this D day, I would guess. Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah. When when when's the latest you want to fire? Because I mean, the long once once December is over, it's going to pick up again, right? So. Are you thinking by December, or are you thinking? Seems like December is a quiet time. Yeah. A lot of people. Um, because last last year when it was happening, well, December came and went, and then it was too late. No one wanted to get started again. We you're still, you're kind of on the timeline. So. Right. Most people will be willing to will be more willing to. Right I would suggest if we're going to pick a date in December that we respect the the cut date for Open J nine. January release because there will be a bunch of stuff that people want to merge ahead of that feature complete date stuff that will go into OMR as part of their contribution. Minimize their pain. When is it? December 15th. 15th. <clears throat> so at least let those people who are in the middle of developing the changes that are going to merge for that. I guess it'll give people, I mean, it'll kind of socialize the change a bit as well, like this is coming kind of thing. Yeah, I think we need to get the automation and everything set up, um, yeah. everything laying cleanly. This also strikes me as the kind of thing we should do in a special committer vote on, and just to get everybody on record having, having either yeah. support or not support, whatever, and, and just, like, get it on record, essentially, right? Because this is a, something that will have a broad effect on the project, so. We can't decide that here. Um, we could decide it in the issue, but I think we should call for a committer vote on this. And just, you know, once we're comfortable that we know what it is that's being proposed, that's the key thing, right? I, I think that needs to be quite a specific, like, this is what we are proposing doing. That's uh, actually for, the, for an official vote, you need to have a very clear statement as to what, you're, yep. what it is that you're voting on, yes or no, or abstain. In the Eclipse uh, handbook. project handbook, there's you can there's a little section in there about what you how you how you're supposed to phrase these things. Has this been a work for downstream projects? <clears throat> they have their own kind of coding style. They're going to change this style. How is that going to be communicated to the downstream? I think the idea is that it doesn't matter. Because it's extending OMR, it doesn't matter what standard they use. Obviously, if you have it, like with, uh, with OpenJ9, we have it in one IDE, so it would be kind of a pain for us. But for most other people, especially using something like Jigsaw, it wouldn't matter. It would just be annoying, I think. It's already annoying. <laughs> yes, yeah, so let's do something annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Try to influence or, or I guess, prove to other projects if this does succeed that. It's worthwhile doing. Um, so, for example, the major consumer of OMR, which is OpenG9, um, it does it does end up being beneficial, which we think it will. Um, we can try to propose doing a similar formatting. But there will be a period of time where there are formats that's different. That's correct. Um, I mean, I mean OpenG9 might be the best idea, especially because of the same coding standard essentially as OMR right now, more or less. Which is to say, two. Point format is So, Dan, if you're still on a call, putting your Open J9 hat on, is, do you see a consequence for Open J9 in terms of OMR making this decision? I mean, other than the impact to Open J9 committers or contributors who are also having to do things in OMR. So the major one to me is the cost for people who are used to a consistent set of, of standards between the two projects are now going to deal with multiple standards. Right. We'll have three at that point. 
So that might be a motivation to have the same kind of discussion in OpenJ9, which may or may not go the same way. Yeah, I will admit I am very gun shy on formatting, auto formatting, going back to experience with the small talk development tools that did auto formatting. Can you elaborate on that? Like what, so what are the, I mean, are, are this, this, this set of concerns that you've raised already or are there other things in that? The major one being readability. Um, formatters do tend, similar to what Andrew said, there is some code that reads better if you ignore the formatter. I think that's a subjective subject. Yes, it is. <laughs> Formatting in general is a subjective subject. Oh, not if it's tool formatted. And it's so controversial. So when you were seeing that in the small talk scenario, were there options for not using the auto formatting tool in sections where it significantly mattered? Not at that time, but small talk tended to be a method at a time. So you simply didn't format methods that. Okay. Yeah, Plank format has a comment style where you can within up any any piece of code you just wrap it around, clank format on and off as a comment, and it will avoid white space formatting. Fully controllable. I think you can also disable that on files as well. Okay, we do want to have concerns about getting, getting tools set up. Uh, I know the rest of you don't share that concern, but I've seen the problems people have had getting compile environments set up. Every additional thing added to that makes life a little bit harder. I mean, I think specifically with something like Clank Format, if we're talking about local development, there's nothing that's going to require people to install Clank Format on their local machine if they want to just write their code so that it follows the coding style. Right? And there's like no need for them to locally have Clank Format installed. Does that make sense to anyone else? Good luck matching the tool exactly. Yeah, you get an error, you make an amend to your commit and fixes it if you yeah, don't have a tool or something. No different than what we do today because committers will go and nitpick yeah. spaces all over the place and yeah. you've yeah. got to make amend commits at the moment anyway to fix that stuff. So it's not different in that sense. It's just rather than a committer having to go and do it, the tool will squawk. Yeah. Okay, so um, I guess I think one of the next steps here is um, is to actually formulate a more formal um, uh, proposal that uh, we vote on, the committers vote on, just so that we can move forward on this um, or not. So maybe that's something you could take as the next step here. Yeah, I think I'll um, re-listen to this conversation and try to nail down some of the con concerns that we have um, and try to provide some I guess, outside feedback from other projects if there are answers to some of these questions as well. Um, but yeah, I think we need a proposal, something more concrete. So you're thinking of having two votes, like one to say yes, this is this, and the second one to say what style we're going to take? Because no. It all no. has to be in the Are we doing it or not? That's the one that I'm thinking of. Because if, if, if we, we don't agree that we're going to go forward with this, then there's no sense. Because I can see, I can see people getting blocked on the style. Like, I mean, I mean a lot of people don't care, but there's only people who do care. Yeah, yeah. We, we've had a vote in the past about a style, and it was um, a long and painful process to get. It wasn't get a committer vote, though. It was, it was not a committer vote. It was a poll, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I can see us getting blocked on that. And then the month going by, and then I was saying, eh. yeah, yeah, well, um, maybe that's for someone who's actually going to look at the different styles and put the styles on the table, right? Yeah, so they have to choose between. Yeah, maybe not all those are equal. Some of these files that people are concerned about might work better with certain yeah. styles. So that's one place to accept some of the feedback that's come during the call, uh, ask people for one or two files that they're particularly concerned about, maybe uh, test out some of these 
main formatting option on those files and run it by those people, and maybe you'll get some money. Yeah, I think something like that was already done, so we might be able to even just reuse a lot of that work. No, no I think there was okay. something put on the GitHub. Rerun yeah, there right. was definitely something Matthew did on GitHub. Matthew has it in his okay. GitHub repo. Yeah, he does. Yeah. His branches are still alive. Okay. One question I had, is there a plan yet for how we're going to roll this out? Like ideally, I, I would like to have the automation set up before we do the formatting, so kind of having all of that set up ahead of time so that then when we do format the entire code base, it's all ready to go and we don't have to like, scramble to figure out why that yes. automation is working. I would imagine when the commit lands, the tooling needs to be in place to okay. battle check and on, on, on a peer level. Do you have a plan for how we're going to do that? I do not yet, um, but there are people who have done this in the past, which I will learn from. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Any more discussion today on this topic? No? Okay. Um, if not, then we will uh, adjourn today's meeting. So thanks, everyone, for uh, participating. And uh, we'll talk again in a couple of weeks. Thanks. Bye. Cheers. Bye.